Hello everyone and welcome to our fifth video from the distance learning playbook study where we are going to share some highlights with you from the topics we covered in December and synthesize some key points from throughout the study. We want to thank everyone that was able to join us for our December synchronous meeting and we hope that you were able to take away some inspiration and ideas from that session. If you were unable to join us for that December synchronous meeting, please know that the recorded version of it is linked in Google Classroom under general resources in your distance learning playbook study plan. During the month of December, we have been learning about feedback and formative assessment in the distance learning environment, as well as ways to improve the schooling experience in any setting. So for today's video, the two success criteria we have are one that you can make connections from what you have read or to what you have heard in previous synchronous sessions to our provided topics from the fourth month's topics. And our second success criterion is that you can apply your learning from this topic study back in your school or district to positively impact student achievement. So let's take a look at that first success criterion and making some connections. So when we consider the highlights for module A, we have to acknowledge the significant role that feedback plays in distance learning. We know from our text that students need to be able to answer three primary questions around feedback. The first question, where am I going? We use our learning intentions and success criteria to help them answer that question. How am I going there? That's really the strategy students need to reach that next step. And finally, where will I go next? That's the plan of action students develop to help them figure out from the feedback what's next for them. So now let's really dig into how each of those three questions influence various types of feedback. When we consider those three questions around feedback, in order for students to know where they are going and how to get there, we need to be intent need to be intentionally plan. We need intentional planning from the teacher around not just the content of the feedback, but how that feedback is delivered. And so Doug Fisher and Nancy Fry give us a few key considerations when providing empathetic feedback to our students. We know that for students to even be open and receptive to feedback, the relationship between the teacher and student is vital. Kids need to feel safe to take risks and see their teacher as credible. When offering empathetic feedback, it's important to tell the person one thing they did well, which we know applies to both teacher to student and student to student feedback, and include we statements in that feedback. This sends students the message that we're in the learning process together. When giving students specific micro feedback, it's important that we are clear about students, clear with students about what they should start doing, stop doing, and continue to do. So a clear and concise approach to feedback. And then finally, in addition to thanking the person for their time and feedback, it's important that teachers collect feedback from students on how their learning experiences are going, which helps teachers to really plan intentionally for future learning. One way to collect feedback from students is through student solicited feedback. In student solicited feedback, teachers poll or survey students regularly to see how the online learning experience is going for them. Teachers ask specific questions which get at the heart of the videos and materials they are using for instruction to find out which ones are effective in really building student understanding and which ones are not. Student solicited feedback encourages students to be metacognitive about their own learning by reflecting on the questions they ask their teachers outside of synchronous sessions that, that week. And so here example of self feedback from students that teachers could use to gauge effectiveness of their learning experience. When students have the level of clarity from feedback around the success criteria to measure where they are in moving towards learning goals, we see continuous growth and progress towards those same learning goals. For this example, students do a quick self assessment of the success criteria 
for that week's learning goals. And the teacher has intentionally thought through how the week's learning goals and success criteria align to the tasks that students are being asked to do. And students are given an opportunity to self-assess both before the learning as well as after the instruction. Formative evaluation, also known as formative assessment. We know from our text that good teaching starts from where the learner is rather than where we would like him or her to be. And so we know that formative evaluation requires that teachers check for understanding throughout lessons, not only at the end. The feedback collected from assessment is most effective when both the student and the teacher understand the results and take action on future teaching and learning. This can be done through a variety of strategies, including virtual exit slips, retellings, teach back videos, polling to respond to questions, or practice tests, just to name a few. And so here is just one example of a possible strategy you could use for formative evaluation through what's called a know and show. Here, students describe in writing what they know about writing a scientific explanation and describe how they would provide evidence to show what they know about creating that scientific explanation. So this could actually be done by sub substituting multiple content areas here in a know and show. We know from our text that some of summative evaluations typically occur at the end of instruction, whether that's the end of a unit, semester, or course. These assessments test a student's cumulative knowledge or skills and should be designed with the learner's developmental needs or the nature of the course or topic in mind. To do this most effectively, the text suggests becoming acquainted with your LMS assessment tools to get to know the timed or randomization features that are often included in those various platforms. Using a live session and encouraging students to have their cameras on to observe them as they take a test is another option as well as using to detect plagiarism. So those are just a couple of examples. In the distance learning classroom, teachers can use a variety of assessment formats, including recording themselves presenting, um, or letting the teacher view it later individually. Regardless of which assessment considerations we follow, the text suggests we have an ethical obligation to our students to embed the topics of academic honesty and ethical decision making into classroom discussions when testing is not our primary focus. Doing so really lets students know that they too are empowered to make decisions about their learning and in the classroom. And that brings us to our last success criterion for this video as well as for the topic study as a whole, and that is you can apply your learning from this study to your classroom, school, or district in a way that positively impacts student achievement. And that's really what module nine was all about, tying everything together in one big picture around learning regardless of the setting. And so in the text, the authors offer some things we've learned from the pandemic that we need to consider moving forward to help make learning better for our students. The first is to focus on what students know and don't know. So in the time that we are given with our students that we use that time to only teach the things they don't know instead of spending time on things they already know. In addition, it's important that we realize a balance is needed in this distance learning setting and that with students and teachers. That includes making sure there's a balance between what students are being asked to do synchronously as well as asynchronously and for teachers that we are utilizing a balance between those four components of the instructional uh, framework so that we ensure that the learning for our students is meaningful and not compliance based. Also, we need to think about how moving forward we can continue to harness the power of technology in a way that really enhances student learning. So what are the elements of technology that we have utilized in this distance learning setting that we want to make sure we continue to use, whether it's in the distance learning setting or face to face to help students really gain a deep understanding of our content? 
And when it comes to our parents in the distance learning setting, the text talks about focusing on those subjects that parents know the least about. So they suggest that might be like math and science. But in addition to that, continuing to encourage our students and their parents to read, then read some more and to talk about what they've read to ensure our students are still getting multiple opportunities to read just like they would in the face to face setting. Also with our parents, if students are making mistakes, we can't depend on the parents to know how to give the appropriate amount of feedback to their um, child. It's not what they were trained to do, and sometimes inadvertently they can give their students so much feedback they end up doing the work for them. So to help with that, it leads into that next bullet that we as teachers need to make sure that we have mechanisms in place in our distance learning or face to face classrooms that is providing our students with the timely feedback they need to keep their learning progressing forward. And this includes teacher feedback as well as mechanisms for peer feedback and student assessment. And then finally, we know that learning is social. So we as teachers again have to make sure we uh, make it a priority to create as multiple or as many opportunities as possible for social interaction and not just for students to interact with us as teachers, but for them to interact among themselves in a way where they are working, sharing, interacting and learning together around whatever your particular content area might be. And then the text also talked about not just improving learning for students, but making learning better for our teachers and really for all educators as well. And so it offered some questions that we need to consider. The first being, how are we going to assess our impact from a distance? So whether you are a teacher, an instructional coach, a principal or a superintendent, how are you instructing the impact that you're, how are you assessing the impact that you are having in this distance learning setting and and thinking about what are ways you can improve that impact as we continue to move forward. In addition, how can we as groups of teachers evaluate, discuss and work together to improve the quality of the, of the instruction we're offering our students to improve the learning outcomes for them? And this really links back to the importance of the PLC process and how are we utilizing that PLC process in the virtual setting to ensure that our students are still getting multiple opportunities to collaborate and learn together based on what they're seeing as evidence from students results. And that plays into the next one as well. How do we enhance the collective efficacy of everyone, of all educators? Because through this pandemic, I think we're all trying to navigate our way um, of the best steps moving forward because we all feel like we're at the bottom of the learning curve because this is new for everyone. So how do we not only focus on improving our own efficacy, but the efficacy of those around us, whether that is our grade level team, that might be at our school level or at the district level, that we are all improving whatever it is our role is with the uh, result or with the outcome of improving the results for our students. And then another suggest in the text add, how can we view this pandemic as an opportunity to really stretch ourselves outside of our comfort zone to learn the best way to help our students in the distance learning setting? And not only that, how can we take those lessons learned to help improve the um, instruction we provide our students in the face to face setting as well? And then finally, this pandemic has taught us about the importance of the relationships with our parents more than ever. So moving forward, how will we continue to engage and communicate with our parents in a way that is improving all of the edu educational outcomes for our students, whether that is the academic, the social or emotional outcomes? We want to thank you all for being a part of this study, and we really hope that you have been able to take away things you can implement to improve your own role in the distance learning setting so that it's better and better for our students. And as always, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me, uh, to me or Carrie, and we really hope you have a great rest of the semester. Thank you.